Today we're going to talk about the revolutions of 1848. And we're going to read a, a primary source from a, a student who took part in these revolutions and get some ideas about what it was to experience these revolutions on, on a personal level, phenomenological level. And hopefully you folks uh, can compare these in your head to the videos we've watched about the recent revolution in Egypt, also driven by youth and some of the ideas um, that drove this modern liberal revolution, and also the, the, the information that we've been looking into in the documentary we've been watching about the, the failed revolution attempt um, in Tiananmen Square in China in 1989, um, and see some parallels uh, between, between all three of these revolutions. Um, this primary source I'm reading again from Aspects of Western Civilization from Perry M. Rogers. Um, excellent book. I suggest, suggest you all get yourself a copy. Um, and so, remember these revolutions of 1848. Essentially, in 1848, liberal revolutions sweep from France all the way across Europe, affecting nearly every country in its path. And these are revolutions that are started by liberal ideas that were spread, ironically, by the absolute uh, emperor, Napoleon, in his march uh, conquering across Europe, eventually stopped by the Russians and the Brits. And Napoleon spreads these liberal ideas. Um, the Congress of Vienna, under the leadership of Metternich, tries to come up with a formula to stop these liberal ideas from spreading because these, these conservatives, as they come to be known, really see liberalism as a, as a destructive cancer on the fabric of society. And, and if you look at it from their perspective and, and, and the, the horror that Napoleon's army causes a, a, as it conquers and kills the population of Europe as it sweeps over it, you can see that their... Um, particularly judgmental ideas about liberalism um, are based in personal experience um, and while we all live in essentially liberal countries at this point anyway in the West and tend to look at the conservative ideals as outdated from their perspective they do make a lot of sense and so these revolutions of 1848 essentially all of them except the one in Denmark where they end up with a constitutional monarchy um, with a bloodless protest and revolution all of the other ones are crushed by conservative elements within their own countries or um, an alliance of other conservative countries coming down and, and crushing them. Again, um, so the ideas of Metternich and the Congress of Vienna and a unification of conservative elements in Europe to stop liberal revolutions is ultimately successful. Um, there is some small successes in the German states, because remember, there's no Germany at this point in 1848. It's a combination of several independent German-speaking countries in the German states, they do get um, elected parliaments or congresses, if you will, but they do um, end up with, with very little power. One thing that does come out of this, these revolutions of 1848 in Germany, is the Frankfurt Assembly. Um, and the Frankfurt Assembly essentially uses the ideology of a nationalism, which is probably the strongest um, ideological force or stronger even than liberalism or conservatism that is birthed out of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, this idea that your country is most important over anything and that it is, it is honorable to fight and die for your country and that one should prove, um, oftentimes through warfare, that your country is better than every other country. Now this idea of nationalism combines in the German states with these liberal revolutions of 1848 and all of the German states eventually send representatives to what's called the Frankfurt Assembly. And they try to decide in a liberal, democratic way how to unify all of the German states into one powerful German empire. Um, the, Fra the Frankfurt Assembly is a failure. And it's a failure not because the people, the representatives, and, and all these German-speaking folks don't want to unify, because they certainly do. It is actually the liberal and democratic processes which grinds the Frankfurt Assembly um, to a halt. People can't agree on how to unify. The nationalism, though, and the idea that Germany needs to unify or wants to unify is remembered by the people that come after, particularly Otto von Bismarck um, from Prussia, who realizes that nationalism is the force that will unify Germany into a powerhouse in Central Europe. Bismarck is wise enough to realize that it's the liberalism that needs to go at this point. And if you combine conservatism, um, militarism, with nationalism, 
then you can unify Germany into a strong empire. So, but back to, to this initial primary source. So we're looking here at one student's experience with these revolutions, how it felt to be part of it um, from that phenomenological level. So, and this is from a student in Bonn, a, a, in, in Westphalia, one of these um, German states. One morning, toward the end of February, 1848, I sat quietly in my attic chamber, working hard at my tragedy of Ulrich von Hutten, when suddenly a friend rushed breathlessly into the room, exclaiming, What? You sitting here? Do you not know what has happened? No, what? The French have driven away Louis Philippe and proclaimed a republic. So the French king's been overthrown. And another interesting side note about these revolutions is, again, you have a democratic, liberal revolution in France. And who do they end up with leading? Another Bonaparte, another relative of Napoleon, comes to be known Napoleon III. And while he is democratically elected, soon the French people realize that absolute power by one individual is once again better than the democratic power of the masses. And so um, Napoleon eventually becomes this new Napoleon. Napoleon III, he is given democratically by a vote absolute power over France. He becomes the next French emperor and as emperor is able to lead France um, forward into um, a more prosperous economic state and a fairly powerful uh, military st militaristic state, although he's going to be crushed by the armies of Bismarck and Prussia later on. Okay, so he says, our narrator, I threw down my pen and that was the end of Ulrich von Hutten. I never touched the manuscript again. We tore down the stairs into the street to the market square, the accustomed meeting place for all the student societies after their midday dinner. So here, the square, the public center, becomes the center of revolutionary um, actions, just like Tahrir Square in Egypt, just like Tiananmen Square in, uh, in China, in Beijing. Although it was still forenoon, the market was already crowded with young men talking excitedly. There was no shouting, no noise, only agitated conversation. What did we want there? This probably no one knew. But since the French had driven away Louis Philippe and proclaimed the Republic, something of course must happen here too. Some of the students had brought their rapiers along, you know, swords, as if it were necessary at once to make an attack or to defend ourselves. We were dominated by a vague feeling as if a great outbreak of elemental forces had begun. You can see some romanticism here too. As if an earthquake was impending of which we had felt the first shock and we instinctively crowded together. And so it's exciting, it's emotional, right? And these are the youth, the intellectual youth of the new Germany. Right? And you can see when you have a revolution, if you want to have revolution, tap into the energy of the youth. Right? They have malleable minds open to new ideas and they have the energy to fight for them. We discussed what had happened and what was to come. And these conversations, excited as they were, certain ideas and catchwords worked themselves to the surface, which expressed more or less the feelings of the people. Now had arrived in Germany the day for the establishment of German unity and the founding of a great, powerful German empire. In the first line, the convocation of national parliament, then the demands for civil rights and liberties, free speech, free press, the right of free assembly, equality before the law. You see, all our liberal philosophers' ideas are coming in here again a freely, freely elected representation of the people with legislative power, remember that from Montesquieu, responsibility of ministers, self-government of the communes, the right of the people to carry arms, that's the first we've heard of that, but remember that from the American Constitution, the formation of a civic guard with elective officers and so on, in short, that which was called a constitutional form of government on a broad democratic basis, liberalism. Republican ideas were at first only sparingly expressed, but the word democracy was soon on all tongues, and many, too, thought it a matter of course that if the princes should try to withhold from the people the rights and liberties demanded, force would take the place of mere petition. Of course, the regeneration of the fatherland must, if possible, be accomplished by peaceable means. Like many of my friends, I was dominated by the feeling that at last the great opportunity had arrived 
for giving to the German people the liberty which was their birthright, and that it was now the first duty of every German to do and to sacrifice everything for this sacred object. We were profoundly, solemnly in earnest. So you see that emotion, that feeling of togetherness, that feeling that we must act. And this really um, reminds me of, of what we've been watching about Tiananmen Square, where the students, very emotional, come together in a sp almost a spontaneous crowd, you know, it's driven by a funeral in Tiananmen Square. But from this kind of very quickly and not necessarily in an organized way, um, evolves these democratic protests. One of the big differences you can see, you know, back in the day in 1848, is these the students with their rapiers, you know, their swords, actually believed that they could forcefully conquer a government without the help of the army. And this is something that never happens anymore, really, not in any successful way, um, in a modern revolution. In a modern revolution, the power of the military is much stronger than the power of the masses. And so, as we've said before, in the modern revolution, the most important ally is the army. If the army stays with the existing powers, the revolution is crushed. If the army goes with a revolution, the existing powers are out. If the army splits, which is what's happening in Syria right now, then you have a civil war, a bloodbath, um, and it's horrific for everyone. Great news from Vienna. There, the students of the university were first to assail the Emperor of Austria with a cry for liberty and citizens' rights. Blood flowed in the streets, and the downfall of Prince Metternich was the result. And as is Metternich, the conservative guy. The students organized themselves as the armed guard of liberty. In the great cries of Prussia, there was a mighty commotion. In the Prussian capital, the masses surged upon the streets, and everybody looked for events of great import. Austria and Prussia are the two most powerful German-speaking countries, right? That's why they're most important and mentioned here. Revolutions there are the most important. They're both unsuccessful. Um, but remember these guys, Austria and Prussia, when we start talking about the unification of Germany um, in the weeks to come. Because who is going to unify Germany between Austria and Prussia becomes the big question um, that creates the course for that unification. It's going to be Prussia. While such tidings rushed in upon us from all sides like a roaring hurricane, we in the university town, the little university town of Bonn, were also busily preparing addresses to the sovereign, to the king, to circulate them for a signature and send them to Berlin, Prussia. On the 18th of March, we too had our mass demonstration. A great multitude gathered for a solemn procession through the streets of the town, the most respectable citizens, not a few professors, and a great number of students and people of all grades marched in close ranks. Thank Tiananmen Square protest. Students, professors, workers united for liberty and eventually crushed. At the head of the, pro of the procession, Professor Kinkel bore the tricolor black, red, and gold, which so long had been prohibited as the revolutionary flag. And that's a flag now in Germany, not a coincidence. Arrived on the market square, he mounted the steps of the city hall and spoke to the assembled throng. He spoke out with wonderful eloquence, his voice ringing out in the most powerful tones as he depicted a resurrection of German unity and greatness and of the liberties and rights of the German people, which now must be conceded by the princes or won by force by the people. So either we're going to get this peacefully or we're going to get it violently. That violent option, no longer really an option for your modern student protests. And when at last he waved the black, red, and gold banner and predicted to a free German nation a magnificent future, enthusiasm without bounds broke forth. People clapped their hands, they shouted, embraced one another, they shed tears. Very, very emotional, um, a very unifying force, this revolutionary spirit driving people um, to extreme action. While on that 18th of March we were parading through the streets, suddenly sinister rumors flew from mouth to mouth. It had been reported that the King of Prussia, after long hesitation, had finally concluded, like the other German princes, to concede the demands that were pouring upon him from all sides. But now a whispered report 
flew around that the soldier, soldiery had suddenly fired upon the people and that a bloody struggle was raging.